our main focus today will be on how do we treat patients on the basis of HER2. So we have <laughs> we have four talks. Basically, we'll be discussing about the Mountaineer Phase Two data and uh, ASCO updates. Also, the role of uh, Transtuzumab Deruxtan in the treatment of metastatic breast cancer. And also, we'll be looking into how the changing paradigm of HER2 testing has happened over the last few years. And lastly, we'll wind up with the panel discussion. So I'll invite my first uh, speaker, Dr. Anuradha, to speak on update on Mountaineer Phase 2 data. Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, can you please share the slides, please? Can the organizer please share the slides? Oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, but you do. Our first speaker is Dr. Anbarasan S. Medical Oncologist, Mumbai. Over to you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Sophia. Uh, thank you, organizers, for this opportunity. Uh, I also, at the outset, I would like to thank Tejas and Tejas sir. Uh, go to the Can presentation, Can we go to please. the next? Yeah. Yeah. So today we are going to discuss mainly about uh, four key updates in ASCO uh, 2024 presentations. So these are, next slide, Destiny 06, Post Monarch, Destiny Breast 07, as well as in above 120 study. Next slide. Destiny 06 is a quite interesting study design where they would like to use TDXD in the first line uh, as an alternate to chemotherapy in hormone positive HER2 low as well as ultra, ultra low subset population. And we are going to see the primary result where from Destiny 06 study. Next slide. So with a little bit of background, we all know that HER2 positive disease constitutes around 15 to 20% of population and uh, remaining 65% of patients are hormone positive. This was the classification which we used previously, but what we found out with the result of Destiny 06 is in those subset of population, almost 60 to 65% were HER2 low, and among those things, 20 to 25% were ultra low, and 10 to 15% were without any membrane stain positivity for HER2 receptor. This constitutes around 10 to 15% of population. So, HER2 low and HER2 ultra low constitutes almost 85 to 90 percent of hormone positive and HER2 low, uh, HER2, uh, HER2 low subset. Move on to next slide. Now, coming to the definition of HER2 low and HER2 ultra low, HER2 low subset constitutes mainly those population with weak to moderate membrane staining in more than 10 percent of tumor cells, or they have failed to incomplete membrane staining. At least 10 percent of tumor cells should be stained. This constitutes HER2 low population. When 
there is faint or incomplete membrane staining in less than 10% of population we call this alto ultra low population so in total they constitute almost 85 to 90% in hormone positive subset of population go on to next slide so why we, why there is a treatment need in this subset of population this is the current uh, treatment landscape and outcome with respect to median pfos in this population when we use endocrine therapy plus cdk4 6 inhibitor as a first line standard therapy the median pfos is only uh, median pfos is 24 to 28 months it is looking quite good right but when we move on further and further in second line setting the median pfos is only 5.5 months if we have any targetable mutation along with it and we are targeting with endocrine therapy then the median pfos is 5.5 months but sadly if we don't get any target therapy and we are using only endocrine as therapy as a monotherapy the median pfos is only 2.6 months and as a third line agent if you try with chemotherapy it is around 6.5 to 7 months it is even less than 10 months duration only so there is a huge unmet need in this population next slide and uh, what are the changes we changed from destiny 06 to destiny 04 there are two key changes in from destiny 06 to 04 one is with respect to study population inclusion in destiny 04 they included only her to low population that concerned only 60 to 65 percent of subset in destiny 06 they included her to low ultra low subset also how they defined her to ultra low subset incomplete membrane staining even less than 10 percent of tumor cell considers her to ultra low and, and when they combined both the subset of this population second thing is with the very beautiful result with the advent of TDXD in the population in after second line uh, chemotherapy, here they upgraded even before chemotherapy. In a chemotherapy naive population, they try to utilize TDXD and then they want to see how it is working very well. So basically, two things. One is they included ultra, ultra low population also. Second thing, they also updated TDXD before chemotherapy in this population. Next slide. So this is, I have defined patient population setting, how they included. With respect to endocrine therapy, at least two lines of endocrine therapy is needed prior to starting of TDXD. But if the patient progress within six months of CDK4-6 inhibitors, then they can be taken after first line also. And also, when the patient is having a progression after adjuvant endocrine therapy, less than 24 months, these patients also started after first line of endocrine therapy. So they are started prior to uh, chemotherapy naive population. Second thing, with respect to endocrine therapy, at least two lines of endocrine therapy. But if the patient having poor subset, in especially if the patient is having a post progression of CDK4 inhibitor less than six months, or after adjuvant chemotherapy less than 24 months, this patient also included into the study design. They have been randomized in one is to one population, and the primary endpoint is PFS in her to low population, and the three secondary endpoint include PFS in intent to treat population, which includes both her to low as well as her to ultra low, and they also assess overall survival separately for her to low population as well as overall survival for intent to treat population. Next slide. And we have, we have discussed elaborately about inclusion criteria. This is with respect to exclusion criteria. Here also they excluded patients who are having prior in, uh, risk of uh, uncontrolled infection or prior documented interstitial lung disease or the patient is having spinal cord compression or active sinus disease has been excluded from the study design. Next slide. And this is with respect to the data cutoff. They did data cutoff at March 18, 2024, and there were 457 events for PFS analysis has been there. For interim first interim OS analysis, the maturity is not achieved. Uh, only 40% of patients were there, and they are planning for second interim analysis at 56% cutoff and final OS analysis at 74% maturity. Next slide. This is with respect to basic demographic feature. This slide is looking basic. I try to decode it. Uh, here, 30% of population were PR negative population, 40% of population, and primary endocrine resistance were 30%. And those patients who are having visceral disease at baseline constitute almost 87%, which is quite high. This indicates how poor biology subset has been taken into the study raising. And 70% of patients had baseline liver metastasis. Next slide. And this is with respect to the number of lines of endocrine therapy. Only 15% of population which constitutes after first line of endocrine therapy, majority are more than two and beyond line of endocrine therapy. And uh, uh, prior toxic chemotherapy, cytotoxic chemotherapy, we are seeing 50% of population in adjuvant setting, they have been utilized. Next slide. Next slide. We go on to the result with respect to the in uh, primary endpoint, that is PFS in her to low population. That is 
significant PS difference is there. 13.2 months versus 8.1 months. The median of around 5.1 months, which is similar to Destiny 04 study. Next slide. And what we are more interested in, intent to treat population. In the intent to treat population, which includes both L2 lows plus L2 utter low, even there, the median PFS is quite significant, 13.2 versus 8.2. And difference is almost 5.1 months, which is similar to that, that of L2 low population. Next slide. With respect to HER2 low, overall survival in HER2 low population and inter tree population, 87 versus 81, uh, uh, it is not significant, mainly because of two reasons. One is the it takes much more time to get data get mature. Second thing is 20% of population in the uh, tree, uh, physician group received TDHD in the second line setting. Next slide. And this is again mentioning how in ultra low subset, the PFS and OS has been significant. You can see the difference is quite significant, 13.2 versus 8.3, and then 4.9 months uh, PFS advantage is there when we use TDXD as a first line in HALTO ultra low population also, and OS data yet to get mature. Next slide. And this subgroup analysis indicates beautiful graph, which is showing all the group of population get benefited from this drug. And the good thing is the response rate. Here you can see the doubling of response rate is seen with the TDXD compared to the physician choice of chemotherapy. Next slide. With respect to safety analysis, next slide. With respect to safety analysis, even though total exposure patient years is much higher with the TDXD arm compared to the physician arm, 438 versus 263, the side effect profile is nearly similar, uh, except the dose interruption is slightly higher and dose reduction is uh, lesser in the TDXD arm. Next slide. Uh, coming to the key adverse event of special interest, there are uh, adverse event of uh, ILT is there, almost 11%, but 3.7% patient had grade 5 adverse event, but most of the time it is manageable. With respect to LV dysfunction, it's not so high uh, and most of the time it is reversible. And there is no associated cardiac failure in patients with TDX when we use TDX. Next slide. Coming to the conclusion of the study design, it has produced good amount of PFS advantage in both L2 low as well as L2 ultra low population. We are expecting for the uh, OS update in subsequent times. And there is no uh, new safety, uh, safety, uh, safety risk in such population. Next slide. With respect to, we are moving on to post monarch study design. Next slide. So we all know that we are trying to continue Abima cycle by Fulvestrin after progression of CDK46 inhibitor. Why we are going to try to do so? Because after progression with CDK4 inhibitor, next line of option will be with target therapy. When we consider target therapy, most of the time the PFS advantage is also not there and the discontinuation rate is also quite higher. We can see that with solar trial capitulo and as well as emerald study design. Next slide. So this is how the trial has been study designed. They included both CDK4 inhibitor progression after adjuvant, uh, when the CDK4 inhibitor has been taken in adjuvant setting, as well as in patients who are taken in metastatic setting. And they have been randomized between Abima plus Fulvestrin versus Placebo plus Fulvestrin. And the primary endpoint is PFS and secondary endpoint include OS, other, other duration of response and other, other data. Next slide. Here we are analyzing the baseline characteristic feature. It is well balanced between the placebo versus Abima, Abima cycle plus Fulvestrin. I would like to highlight a few key things in this study design, where the visceral metastasis rate is almost 60% and uh, prior CDK use duration. Almost 70% of population had more than 12 months duration. 30% of population had less than 12 months of CDK46 inhibitors. And with respect to median duration with uh, CDK46 inhibitor, palbocyclib is 20 months, ribocyclib is around 15 months. Abimacyclib patient also included, but the number of population is slightly less. Next slide. Coming to the six month PFS rate, it is 50 versus 37%, and hazard ratio is also 0.73. That is 27% reduction in terms of median, uh, median PFS is there. Next slide. Uh, with this is subgroup analysis. Few things I would like to point out. When the prior CDK46 inhibitor is palbocyclic, the difference is quite good. And uh, also, when the duration is more than 12 months, then also the result is quite good and also in patient with liver metastasis. Next slide. This is with respect to subgroup analysis again. When the CDK4 inhibitor is duration is more than 12 months, then the median PFS is slightly better, 7 versus 5.4, and the hazard ratio is 0.7. Next slide. 
and even in visceral without visceral metastasis the response is slightly better here the median pfs goes up to 11.1 versus 5.6 months next slide and this is with respect to the ctd analysis esr and pic 3 c mutation it uh, it re responded very beautifully with all the subset of population also next slide and discontinuation rate which is the key here discontinuation rate is quite lesser when we compare with solar capital or ls system this uh, abima cycle with full western discontinuation rate is slightly lesser only next slide uh, this is with respect to the conclusion there is 21 uh, 27% risk reduction for pfs event is there and there are very good amount of subset of patient who are responded with this abima cycle with full western combination with lesser discontinuation rate in this population next slide so we go on to the third part of uh, destiny 07 study design here it is a phase 1 or phase 2 study design where they try to study both the uh, tdxd as a single agent in first line setting for her2 positive metastatic breast cancer as well as tdxd with pertuzumab in her2 positive metastatic breast cancer population next slide so tdxd no there is no further introduction it has been well described they want to study how it is doing in the first line as well as in combination with pertuzumab. That is the key background behind this Destiny 07 study design. Next slide. And uh, this is the group of patients they have been included. Mainly those patients who are having stable brain stable disease, uh, brain metastasis, as well as uh, DFI should be more than 12 months if they progress after adjuvant uh, anti her therapy. There are three um, in the study design. Primary endpoint is safety and toler tolerability. Key secondary endpoint include oral response rate and PFS. Next slide. So this is with respect to the median age 57. I would like to highlight a few things. One is what are the prior treatment with respect to TDXD arm? It is trastuzumab and pertuzumab. Almost uh, pertu plus trastuzumab combined 21% of population. In TDXD plus pertuzumab arm, almost 10% of patients had prior pertuzumab usage. Next slide. This is with respect to response rate. We are seeing only the two arms, but one is TDXD and another one is TDXD plus pembrolizumab. The response rate is 76 versus 84. Uh, next slide. One thing I would like to highlight is the complete response rate is slightly higher. Here it is 15%. Here it is almost 30% when the combination arm is being used. And this is seen irrespective of hormone positive or negative status. The response rate, especially CR rate is doubled when we combine TDXD with pertuzumab. Next slide. With respect to dose adverse event, when we combine the drug, obviously we expect little more side effects. There is higher dose interruption is there and there is also higher discontinuation rate is also higher. Next slide. And also they had higher incidence of pneumonia and key other features like there is higher incidence of anemia as well as higher incidence of uh, diarrhea is seen with combination arm. Next slide. This is the summary of this Destiny 07 study design where they have PFS advantage is there, good amount of response rate, and there is no other high risk safety profile in this population. Uh, sir, can I go ahead with the next presentation or uh, I will stop with this? I think Anmar is all <laughs> So we might discuss in the panel discussion also. Sure, sir. Thanks. So uh, is Dr. Anuda ready? Then I think we can take start with her presentation yes so am i am i audible yes ma'am you audible ma'am i'll play your slide ma'am you can just say next ma'am So I am going to be presenting the results of that phase two study of tucatinib and trastuzumab for HER2 positive metastatic CRC. So tucatinib is an anti-HER2 directed TKI, which has all uh, which uh, has earlier shown uh, activity in uh, HER2 positive carcinoma metastatic carcinoma breast with active brain meds in combination with capecitabine and trastuzumab. Here it is uh, being tested in colorectal cancer. Small, uh, just a brief background that HER2 overexpression or amplification is seen in 3% of the patients with CRC. It is highly selective HER2 directed uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor that has shown preclinical tumor activity in combination with trastuzumab. So, the primary results were approved as 
for patients with HER2 positive MCRC RAS wild type patients. Here are the it's a phase two trial and we present the final analysis. So in the primary analysis, the pre uh, the uh, median follow up was sixteen point three months and the duration there was a overall response rate of thirty eight percent with the duration of response being twelve point four months, PFS of eight point two, and a median OS was twenty four months. 60% of the patients had one or two grade diarrhea, which was the most common adverse effect. But grade three was very less in approximately 3% of the patients, leading to discontinuation in 6% of the patient and no deaths were attributed to the adverse events. Next slide, please. Next slide. So it was a multi-center open label phase two study. Patients who have received... Uh, therapy in the metastatic setting, colorectal cancer, wild type patients with a measurable disease, prior chemotherapy was allowed and anti-VEGF monoclonal antibodies were also allowed. The patients who were tested HER2 positive by IHC fish or NGS with no anti-HER2 directed therapy prior was included. They were divided into cohorts with tocatinib and trastuzumab. Tocatinib is a oral TKI. And the, the patients in cohort A were 45, B and C were 41 and 31 respectively. Cohort C was only to tocatinib. The study endpoints primary, which were earlier as over, overall response rate and secondary being the duration of response, PFS and OS. Safety was also analyzed. And for the final analysis, the efficacy safety endpoints were evaluated. They remained the same. Biomarker analysis, including a long-term responder analysis, were exploratory. Next slide, please. In the efficacy outcomes and the final analysis, the overall response rate, which was earlier 38%, it was 39.3%. The duration of response was 15.2 months, PFS being 8.1 month, and the overall survival was nearly two years at a median follow-up of 32.4 uh, months. Next slide, please. <coughs> In the long-term response analysis, 27% of the patients had a long-term response, which was defined as having more than 12 months of, uh, months of duration of treatment with a patient achieving complete response, partial response, or stable disease. Is, it, the LTR status was found among a range of HER2 expression levels and no evident associations between LTR status and clinical pathological features, uh, HER2 expression level, or genomic alterations were found. There were uh, SNVs, in, in insertions, deletions, amplification, or a combination of both were seen. Next slide, please. So, uh, in this phase two uh, trial, it, the safety profile and the final analysis continued to be good. And the, the, the combination was well tolerated with a longer follow-up. There were no grade five treatment related adverse effects. The discontinuation rate were uh, less, were around five to six percent, and there were very less uh, 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 toxicities. And any grade three uh, toxicities were higher in the final analysis in the range of forty percent, but the discontinuation was not there. Next slide, please. So majority of the uh, treatment-related adverse events were low-grade and the rates were stable with longer follow-up. They mostly were diarrhea, which was 66%, fatigue was 44 and nausea was 34% and mostly were of low-grade. The uh, grade 3 remained low and the combination was well-tolerated. Next slide, please. So all the testing methods which were used for HER2 testing like uh, IHC, FISH or tissue NGS or blood NGS, the clinical efficacy was similar across the three central methods. The response rates were in the range of more than 40% in all the methods which were tested and the duration of response remained more than 15 months with the PFS more than 8 months in all the, in all the subtypes. Next slide. So... Considering the duration of response and the PFS benefit and the overall response rate of around 40% with a well-tolerated uh, safety profile, tocatinib with trastuzumab was, uh, in the final analysis, uh, it showed it, that it had a clinically meaningful anti-tumor activity and the favorable toler tolerability profile. There was a, a duration of response median of 15.2 months and a median OS of 2 years. Next slide, please. So, a take-home point is that it is safe, well-tolerated with a meaningful anti-tumor activity and an option of patients who have received more than two lines in the metastatic setting are 
her was uh, ras wild type and express her to expression by either of the method by ngs ifc or fish thank you abhi bolna nahi hoga thank you ma'am Our next speaker is Dr. Devendra Pal, medical oncologist, Mumbai. Over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, will you be moving the slides? Devendra, you have to, I think, uh, first uh, upload the first. They have to remove this slide and okay. then they can upload. Okay, okay, yes. So you can directly share your slides, sir. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Are my slide visible? Yes, sir. It is visible. Yeah. So good evening, everyone. Uh, I'll be talking on uh, role of TDXT in her to express uh, expression in tum uh, breast tumors. Uh, most most of it has been actually the uh, latest part has been initially discussed with Dr. by Dr. Sekar. So I'll be discussing about uh, Destiny uh, three and four trials. Uh, I'll be talking on. Can you, uh, can you make it uh, full full screen? I think still it is not full. Slide show, my jacket, na? Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay. Fine. Yeah. Fine. It's so visible now. Yeah. 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 So I'll be discussing about the role of TDXT in management of HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer, and HER2 low status and clinical implications of low status. first coming to the role of ddxt in uh, hr positive breast cancer so uh, to start with the basics uh, everyone knows about it i'll be going to be brief so ddxt is a monoclonal antibody which is uh, ig uh, g1 along with the um, uh, payload which is attached with the linker the uh, link the payload is uh, topoisomerase 1 inhibitor which is a, uh, which is a cytotoxic agent uh there is high drug to antibody ratio so each uh, antibody molecule has eight uh, payloads and the half life of the payload is uh, short so uh, adverse effects are not very long uh, long lasting the linker is uh, stably linked so it uh, dissociates only intracellularly and there is a bystander tumor effect also that means the 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 payload goes from one cell to the other and increase the cytotoxicity so this is the monoclonal antibody shown here and uh, one antibody attached to eight payloads uh, after uh, this uh, uh, trastuzumab uh, attached to the uh, receptor the uh, molecule is internalized uh, the tdx uh, the payload is cleaved payload goes to the nucleus uh, it causes the cell death and after uh, this uh, after lysis of this uh, first cell the payload goes to the uh, bystander cells so uh, they, that cell the increases the toxicity of the surrounding cells also and it has been shown that up to 60% of the pre treated patients of hr positive positivity they respond to trastuzumab daristrican the destiny breast 03 was a open label trial multi center phase 3 in which unselected uh, unresectable or metastatic hr positive breast cancer patients were taken uh, those patient who had brain metastasis stable brain metastasis were also taken uh, the uh, stratification was done on the basis of hr status prior uh, treatment with trastuzumab and history of visceral disease patients were randomized one is to one between tdxt and uh, ddm1 which is uh, a standard molecule for brain metastasis also doses were standard 5.4 and 3.6 mg primary endpoints were um, overall survival pfs and secondary endpoints were overall response rates uh most of the uh, 50% of the patients included in the trial were hr positive 15% had brain metastasis 70% had visceral disease and 61% had uh, used prior trastuzumab and most of the patients had uh, two lines of uh, previous treatment done uh, and uh, the uh, one group could change over to the other group so that means uh, tdx uh, first uh, first use and then later on they can be 
they can use TDM one, and those who are exposed to TDM one, they were they can could have been shifted to crossover to TDXD. As seen in this Kaplan Muir graphs uh, curves. So uh, with TDXD, uh, the one year progression free survival, uh, seventy five percent of the patients were progression free at one year. The TDM one was less than half. There is thirty four percent of patients were progression free. At uh, two years, 53% uh, patients with TDXD were progression free, and with TDM1, only 26.4%. The median TFS uh, was way high for TDXD, it is around four times. So, around seven months for TDM1 and 28.8 months for um, TDXD with highly significant T e value, hazard is, is 0.33. Uh, this overall survival, uh, Kaplan Muir also shows uh, significant improvement in survival with TDXT at one year. TDXT, uh, uh, patient with TDXT, 94% was surviving, and with TDM1, uh, 86%. And at two years, 70% uh, of patients on TDM1 and 77% patients on TDXT was surviving. The median survival uh, is not reached yet. But uh, this hazard ratio is 0.64 percent, means 36 percent advantage is there uh, for using uh, TDXT as uh, before TDM1. The adverse effects which have been updated last year, uh, so the ILD incidence was 15.2 percent, and uh, most of these were grade one or two, and there's no grade three, four or five uh, ILDs. Other adverse effects were like usual chemotherapy side effects like nausea, vomiting, alopecia, and uh, neutropenia grade 3, more than, more than grade 3 was only 16%. So now, considering the uh, response in, uh, in relation to age of the patient and brain metastasis, so it was shown that uh, the patients divided uh, in less than 65 and more than 65 years random division, I think. So there was no difference in the uh, median progression free survival and overall survival um, in patients of uh, these two groups. So less than 65 and more than 65, uh, the groups uh, fared equally and efficacy was equal in the younger and uh, older patients. The adverse effects uh, were seen uh, as the age increased beyond 65, so there were more adverse effects uh, with TDXD. Uh, and uh, grade 5 adverse effects were actually very minimal in, uh, all, in both the age groups, less than 65 <laughs> and more than 65. So, and uh, all adverse effects other than ILD also in patients more than 65 years of age were higher than as compared to less than 65 years old patients. So most of these uh, adverse effects are uh, low grade and uh, not much troublesome. Now, as per the uh, CNS response rates with TDXT, those patients who were treated and were stable uh, were having stable brain metastasis, <clears throat> TDXT, uh, uh, TFS with TDXT was 12.3 months. And with comparator, it was 8.7 months with hazard ratio of 0.59. So significant improvement in the uh, brain PFS <clears throat> with TDXD first line. Those patients with untreated uh, and active brain metastasis, responses were very poor uh, with TDM1. And excellent responses were seen with TDXD with the <coughs> PFS of 18.5 months versus 4 months with TDM1. This waterfall plot shows uh, uh, the decrease in the uh, brain metastatic lesions, so con uh, control over the brain uh, metastatic lesions. Uh, the responses and the uh, the uh, decrease in the uh, brain to metastasis uh, was more but deeper with TDXT as compared to the comparator. And comparator molecules were the standard uh, like uh, molecules which we use for brain metastasis, like TDM1, Trastuzumab, Capstabin, or lab, tap, or lab cap. So this is a pooled analysis of uh, Destiny Breast 1, 2, and 3 trials, which shows uh, more shrinkage of brain metastasis in TDXT as compared to the other comparator uh, protocols. 
this was uh, shown in uh, other two trials also this tuxedo one study uh, which showed that 73.3 percent intracranial response rate with tdxt and pfs of 14 months similarly good excellent responses were seen uh, in rosset uh, bm trial which has a retrospective review of patients with HER2 positive MBC with brain metastasis and leptomeningeal disease. So HER2 status uh, is, a, is, is a biomarker which defines uh, the, the applicability of uh, uh, anti-HER2 agents. So what about uh, HER, HER low status and its clinical implications on treatment? So as has been discussed just before, uh, so I'll not be going back uh, again into that just briefly. Uh, the HER, the uh, HER low status is when it is uh, HER by IHC is one or two without ISH positivity, and uh, most of this uh, uh, this if we divide the breast uh, cancers into HER triple negative and HER two HR positive. So most of these low, uh, uh, HER low uh, cases are seen in uh, HR positive uh, cancers. So uh, in uh, TNBC, so most of this uh, uh, HER uh, are basically they turn out to be low, and less cases turn out to be HER low, and more are triple negative only. So there's more likelihood of finding HER low patients in uh, HR positive patient as compared to triple negative patients. There are some challenges for interpreting HER2, HER2 low breast cancers because uh, it is an evolving field and uh, the definition of HER2 low was not uh, well-defined. Now it is getting uh, well-defined and with increasing awareness, uh, we are diagnosing and we are paying attention to HER uh, low status. The tumor quality also affects the HER uh, status because the tumor degrades uh, the old blocks. Probably the uh, the reliability of the test is less. And there's intratumoral heterogeneity also, which can result in interpretation uh, deficit. And IHC is also a subjective analysis, so uh, it may vary from uh, observer to observer. And IHC has limitations because it is a subjective test. I think it will be discussed later on with Dr. Tanuja Shet. So this uh, uh, efficacy of TDXT in R2 low breast cancers was uh, report, reported in J101 trial. And you can see it has shown that uh, the um, uh, PFS was shorter in uh, those with IHC1 uh, and as compared to IHC2. Although later on, destiny breast trials have shown that uh, uh, both uh, HER, IHC1 to uh, the uh, PFS doesn't matter depending on whatever is the is the uh, uh, IHC1 or 2 status. Destiny 4 was the next trial uh, with TDXT, which uh, evaluated uh, HER low status and uh, TDXT. So in this uh, study, HER2 low patients like IHC1 plus and IHC2 plus ISH negative and uh, unresectable metastatic breast cancer patients post one to previous lines of therapy and HR positive disease only, which were uh, which were a post endocrine therapy uh, failure. So they were randomized two to one in two to one ratio to TDXT and uh, treatment of uh, physician choice. The primary endpoint being the PFS and secondary endpoint being the PFS and OS and other end, secondary endpoint being overall, overall response rates. So these Kaplan-Meier graphs are showing the improvement in PFS of both HR positive patient and all the patients and all other patients. So in a hormone receptor positive patient, the PFS improved from, from 4.4 months in treatment of physician choice to 10 months uh, with TDX. And in all the patients, uh, the results are almost similar, 5.1 months versus 9.9 .9 months with a very good hazard ratio of 0.5. So 50% improvement in the progression survival. Updated PFS also shows uh, similar uh, figures. So uh, there's improvement in the PFS 
and HR ratios are 0.37. So significant improvement in the progression of survival with use of uh, DDX as compared to the treatment of uh, physician choice. The median follow-up uh, is also longer with DDXT. Overall survival uh, is also uh, shown to be uh, significantly improved uh, so with HR in HR positive cohort, uh, 24 uh, months overall survival uh, was 49% uh, in the TDXT arm versus 35% in uh, treatment of physician choice arm. And in all patients, HR positive and HR negative, again, uh, at uh, two years, uh, almost similar uh, improvement is seen uh, with TDX uh, and uh, TPC. So 47% were surviving at two years in TDX and 32% in the uh, TPC arm. At three years, uh, these uh, figures were 16% and 26% of uh, patients surviving. So, and uh, these, this slide is showing the um, improvement in the PFS and OS in patients who are <clears throat> HR negative. So the uh, massive improvement in seen in those patients who are HR, uh, HR negative and uh, <clears throat> HER low. Uh, in HR, uh, HR negative patient, PFS improved from uh, around three months to 8.5 months with TDXT. And OS more than doubled from eight months uh, in treatment of physician choice to 18 months with uh, TDXT. So, uh, it, TDXT is more effective in those patients who are uh, hormone receptor negative. Uh, the adverse effects, uh, they are, most of the adverse effects are uh, are low grade. Uh, the top, uh, the ILD, top, uh, ILD uh, the rate is 12.1%, uh, this in destiny 4. And most of these uh, ILDs are grade 1 and grade 2. Uh, with very few grade 3 and uh, grade 5 adverse effects. Uh, reduction in the ejection fraction also was seen in overall 4.9%. And uh, it was, there were more of uh, grade 2 adverse effects. Cardiac failures were very insignificant uh, in TD exams. So, uh, is there any difference? Uh, in the responses depending on uh, the uh, H, the HER uh, level, uh, like either one plus or two plus. So it is shown that uh, whatever the level of uh, HER expression one plus or two plus, uh, the responses are good, and uh, they are comparable responses in uh, both these groups. Subset analysis of destiny based four also shows. Improvement uh, with TDX to uh, TDXT in all groups, whether they were uh, repeat progressors or whatever the disease burden, low disease burden or high disease burden, HER uh, one plus or two plus prior therapies, whatever the number of prior therapies, whatever the age of the patient less than sixty five or more than sixty five, and baseline CNS metastasis or prior anthracycline use. So all these patients benefited with uh, TDXT. HER is a uh, dynamic, uh, it's, it's a spectrum actually, which moves from uh, uh, zero to ultra low to uh, one plus to two plus to three plus. So uh, the changes in the HER status happens uh, with time. So it's seen that uh, most of these uh, changes happen uh, uh, like this, those patients who are ER positive tumors. So um, very few of them convert to HER zero over time as compared to triple negative breast cancers. So uh, even in those patients who are HER low, 50% of these um, uh, these tumors, they turn to HER, uh, HER zero. So there's more chances of uh, low um, HER2 status turning to HER negative in TNBC as compared to uh, ER positive tumors. So ER positive tumors, once they are detected to be uh, HER low, very few of them turn to be HER negative over time. So the most dreadful toxicity of uh, DDXT, so as we uh, 
keep on in using the drug as the time goes on, as the experience increases. So we become wiser in managing the drug toxicity. So we should be careful, uh, very careful in detecting uh, the interstitial lung disease at a very early stage. It should be suspected rather than uh, like become clinically manifest. So uh, before starting a patient, uh, we should be uh, careful of, of the symptoms of ILD, like any cough, dyspnea, fever, or any any worsening of the respiratory symptoms. So, uh, if something like this happens, then a patient should be a patient has to be counselled before starting the therapy. Uh, they should be immediately uh, investigated to uh, reach to conclusion whether the uh, ILD is settling in or not by doing uh, HRCT and uh, PFTs and uh, blood tests. Uh, when we suspect and uh, it's confirmed that uh, ILD is set in, uh, in grade one, uh, whatever the grade, it, the drug has to be uh, stopped till the time uh, the patient recovers. And uh, in grade in, uh, in grade one, uh, we can start uh, reinstitute the therapy after resolution of the symptoms. But in grade two, it to permanently discontinue. The treatment is also according to the, according to the grade. In initial grade, grade one, uh, so we can start corticosteroid in dose of 0.5 milligram per kg with slow taper. And if it is grade two, then dose is double than this. So, so one mg per kg prednisolone uh, prolonged duration with slow taper. So if uh, uh, symptoms dissolve within 28 days of onset of the disease of the ILD, then we can use, we can re-challenge with the same dose. But if symptoms took more than 28 days, to settle down, then dose reduction has to be done. First reduction is to the dose from 5.4. Uh, first dose reduction is 4.4 and say final dose reduction is 3.2. And we should not be doing dose escalation after those patients where dose reduction has been done. Like uh, like we do in other, other cases, sometimes we re-challenge, but here re-challenge should not be done. So pre -TA, pre, uh, before use of TDXT, uh, complete history examination, the pulmonary status, HRCT, maybe PFT need to be done. And when patient is on treatment, HRCT should be done once every 12 weeks or once every six to nine months for those patients who have some respiratory uh, symptoms. Obviously, vital examination, vital checkup and SpO2 needs to be done. If ILD is suspected, then we should be doing um, CT scans and uh, uh, pulmonary function tests. And uh, we'll be holding the TDX therapy, TDX therapy whenever we suspect it to be uh, adverse effects, uh, ILD adverse effects. We can monitor and involve the pulmonologist uh, in the management of uh, ILD. So to summarize, uh, R2 is a dynamic marker which can demonstrate intra and intertumoral heterogeneity and which may change from early stage to late stage. So it is very dynamic. Proportion of HER to low is higher in uh, HR positive breast cancer as compared to triple negative. And more HR negative, more and more of triple negative, they convert to uh, HER zero over time. Destiny breast zero four has shown significant uh, improvement in PA percent OS in patients with HER low metastatic breast cancers who were previously treated with the previous lines of uh, therapy. And uh, the results were similar in both HER1 plus or HER2 plus tumors. So based on this uh, Destiny Breast 4 data, TDX has been approved in many countries uh, for HER, for low HER patients. Thank you so much for patient listening. Thank you, sir. Our next speaker, Sophia, can I share the screen? Yes, ma'am. Our next speaker is Dr. Tanuja M. Shet, Medical Oncologist, Mumbai. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, just to clarify, I'm not a, a medical oncologist. I'm a pathologist. And uh, in a... I think, uh, is my screen full screen? Uh, no, ma'am, you have to do it. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, okay. Thank you, everyone. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Tejin Singh, uh, Tejinder Singh and all the members of this uh, meeting for inviting me. As I said, that uh, 
I think before you talk about any therapy in her to low, you need to understand what is the testing because then only we are a little wiser. So my aim here is in the next 15 minutes to talk about the evolving testing landscape of her to positive breast cancer. I'll first talk about what the existing, what are the existing testing methods? What is this concept of low HER2? And we, why, what are the methods that we use to call something as low HER2? And are there any alternatives? So this, all of you know that HER2 is a tyrosine kinase receptor. Till a year or two back, we were looking at amplified HER2 as a target where when it is amplified, it heterodimerizes with other HER molecules and produces a cascade of events that leads to growth. So if you target HER2 when it is amplified, the tumor stops growing and you tend to kill the tumor cell. So that was a concept till about before the destiny began. So at that point of time, our HER2 testing methods, the gold standard was clearly FISH because what we, we needed to target was the amplified HER2. And this amplified HER2 was on the membrane and of all these cells. And that's why we need to actually determine how much copy number of HER2 is there. It had to be double that of normal. So if it is normal, copy number is two. So more than four was our target. Now, immunostochemistry is actually a surrogate marker because what it is doing is it is, it is testing the protein or the receptors that are expressed in the case of an amplified HER2. And hence, depending on the number of copies of HER2 you had, the expression of the membrane varied. So if you had two copies, you had X number of receptors. If you have four copies, you have more protein. So that's why immunohistochemistry is a surrogate marker. And the definition of HER2 positivity is HER2 3 plus or 2 plus, which is amplified by FISH. So the HER2 story began the, uh, by the ASCO cap first coming up with the definition in 2000. And it said that time we were more interested in defining positive. So the only definition we used that time was that more than three plus uh, that complete membrane staining or, or, or of or by HER2 IHC was considered as three plus. We had an equivocal and a score one plus and zero were clubbed together. Then in 2000, there were not many labs testing for fish. So as the 2007 came in, more and more guidelines. Now we actually had a guideline for the ish reporting as well. And of course, in 2000 also we had that, but the first complete guideline which incorporated FISH and IFC was the 2007 guideline. And now what was happening was people thought that we were over calling HER2 as HER2 positive. So we went back to a definition of complete intense staining of the cell tumor cell membrane in greater than 30% of the invasive cancer cells as 3 plus. Then again, we came to an era where we, were, we became fear of missing out. So what we decided, okay, let's include more and more cases. So we now went back to the 10% cutoff, but we also created several groups within the uh, fish groups. And we had now even an equivocal category. The 2018 guideline finally decided, I think we've received, we have reached a stability as far as amplification is concerned in her too. And we now have deleted the equivocal terms. So, as I said, in seven, we use a, we generally use a dual fish. That means we use one probe for the HER2 and one probe for the chromosome 70. And the ratio of that in 2007, we considered 2.2. It was changed to two in 2013. And in 2018, finally, we kept the ratio as two, but we have evolved the fish guidelines and we'll just see in the next few slides. So, as I said, the thing became more complex in 2013. Now, what was the complexity? All of us know that if your HER2 ratio with SEP17 ratio is less than 2 and the average HER2 is less than 4, that means average HER2 on the cell nucleus a copy number is less than 4, it is FISH negative. If you have HER2 of greater than 4 and the ratio between HER2 and SEP17 of greater than 2, then this is clearly an amplified HER2. Now, there were three other groups. Now, what are the three other groups? If you have a scene where the ratio is greater than 2, but the average HER2 is not more than 4, it is less than 4. Now, why would this happen? Obviously, because your denominator is less and that's why the HER2 ratio is falsely amplified. Now, in 2013, we call this as ish positive, but we've changed in that in 2018. There was another subset of HER2 clearly greater than 6, but the ratio was not reaching 2 because of polysomy or increase in the denominator and the ratio that's why it came down. Now, this is also considered as each positive. 
There was another situation when where this ratio was not two, but the copy numbers were between four to six. Now this was called as an equivocal group, and this group was uh, we needed to have either a, a additional probe or you needed an alternate antibody. You know, we have some articles in this era which are published and you can Google us and you can see that we looked at an alternative probe rather than the normal probe and we found better results. Then came the ASCO CAP guidelines of 2018 and what it did was it decided to get some semblance because people were very disgusted with the term equivocal and hence they decided that with the when there were studies that actually looked at fish impact on survival with transtuzumab, they realized that when your ratio is greater than two, but your HER2 is not greater than four, then there is no benefit of transtuzumab. So this was now called as non-amplified. When your ratio is less than two, that means HER2, CEP17 ratio less than two, and your copy number is between four to six, then that was also called um, non-amplified. Now this group four is a very a peculiar group and you need to do more in this group because many times you this is a polysomy a impacted group and that is why where most of our work that we're doing presently lies in. So this is our own data which Trupti has analyzed and we found that out of some 2700 patients a few of which were 2013 guidelines called amplified but in 2018, they became non-amplified with the application of these guidelines. We are evolve, We are still follow up. Uh, we are following up this patient to see the benefit that they had. So, what is the HER2 ASCO 2018 guidelines? Now, when you have no staining, you call it cell zero. But within that zero group, we have an ultra low group where you have incomplete. So, there are two things in HER2 IHC: the completeness of the membrane staining and the percentage of cells that are staining. So if you have weak, incomplete staining of less than 10% of invasive cells, then you call it still zero. When you have weak, incomplete staining, but you have in greater than 10% of the invasive cells, you call it IHC1+. plus. You need to have a complete membrane staining to call it as 2+. plus. In 2+, plus, it is weak to moderate. When it's strong, you call it 3+. plus. So that was the complete membrane, incomplete membrane, intensity of staining and a cutoff of 10% that was important. Now, we all have heard the previous talk and we know today that there is a lot that if you take out all the things, there is a group of around 55 to 60% of the patient that is HR positive or triple negative, which are IHC1 plus and or IHC2 plus, but each non-amplified. Now, they represent a group where you have heard to a little above normal. Now, can we target it with something? And yes, of course, today these are called as HER2 low. And that's because of NHER2, because you know that you need what basically you need that low HER2 for. It is a it's a carrier or a vehicle. Uh, Transtuzumab is attached to a cytotoxic drug. And this both go into the cell and transtuzumab is the entry point because it is little more than normal. It ensures that the, the toxic drug only goes to the tumor cell, does not go to the adjacent cell. And that's why we need her the her to, to be above normal so that only the tumor cells are targeted. So why this definition of HER2 is used? This is not based on somebody's idiosyncrasy. We know that normally we have around 20,000 HER2 receptor molecules per cell. When it is 3 plus, you have around 23 lakhs. And when it is 0, uh, when it is 1 plus, you have 1 lakh. When you have 2 plus, it has 2 lakhs. Now, we have to target this group because what you're trying to do is avoid the 20,000. It has to be at least twice more than the 20,000. And that is the reason. And you don't need amplified because for amplified, you have other drugs that are available. So you need something. And that's the reason we need this definition of 1 plus and 2 plus has been defined. So the score 1 plus and 2 plus non-amplified has been chosen so that you have enough receptors for the antibody drug quantities to attach and deliver the payload without harm to the adjacent normal cells. So this is the famous Destiny 4 trial. And all of you have heard that there was a PFS benefit. And I am not added because I, I didn't have the slides for the Destiny uh, 6 trial. So that's another very seminal trial. So what is the definition of HER2? That it is IHC score 1 plus and 2 plus non-amplified by ISH. And the NCCN guidelines now use TDX1 in second line treatment of metastatic breast cancer, which is HER, sorry, hormone positive with HER2 low or triple negative, which is non-BRCA mutated. So should be reported. Now, many of us, 
do not yet put that hurtulo definition and i will tell you why we don't do it so number one is yes earlier he clubbed her two negative at zero plus and one plus now we split them and we split them as her two negative score zero and her two low score one plus but we can only do this if we are using the specific protocol on the ihc machine and that's one of the reasons where in tata at least we have not implemented it and i'll talk to you about that in some while cap as for cap smo uk all have said that you report it as this and you put a caveat that this low to low if the patient is her to low that this patient is eligible for the appropriate therapy now is it a different biological disease the answer is no because if you for example i think it's just a marker so for example if you have a hormone receptor positive patient with low her to it will its biological is driven by the hormone receptor Similar, similarly, the triple negative breast cancer, which is HER2 low, will behave like a triple negative breast cancer. But it nevertheless, there are slightly more reports about better chemotherapy responses with TNBCs, which are HER2 low. Now, what are the testing issues? Number one is restricted platform. We cannot use, like I've seen medical oncologists see any HER2 low and use HER2 IHC of one plus and use it interchangeably with or to low no you have to have the ventana 4b5 system because that's what is used in the destiny trial number two is it's heavily uh, dependent on pre-analytic number three is that only tissues have to be cell uh, thing of course there are caveats to this the staining protocol has to be rigid you cannot vary it depending on the you know because you poor blocks you change the training protocol you need to use composite controls and I will talk to you about it. And there is a little bit of uh, training in reporting that is required with lower to low and that's the, also a challenge. So in the Destiny 4 trial, the tissue, most of the studies were done on tissues fixed in 10% neutrophil for formalin, uh, which were fixed up to 6 to 72 hours. And the sections had to be 4 mil micrometer thick. And you, had, you could not use unstained slides, which are old, because that resulted in fallen uh, to low. Now, they did use cytological specimens. As long as they had 50 viable tumor cells with associated stroma, all others were excluded. Decalcified bone metastasis were also excluded. Now, this is the lock protocol. This is one particular number that the Ventana or the Roche team gives you. Now, what does it mean is that every second of that protocol cannot be changed. So, for example, you have an antibody uh, retrieval time of 12 minutes that has to remain prevalent. So example, we are using the benchmark XT till around four years ago. Now, in the, if the retrieval in the benchmark XT was 12 minutes, then our protocol of four years ago was valid. But if, were, but if we used it as 16 minutes, then that HER2 role, which we reported four years ago, is not HER2 low. It is not, it has not been done in an appropriate manner. So this is what you need to understand. That when I'm reporting, we've not changed to her to low in Tata Hospital because when we instituted this program in our ultra machine, our two plus also started falling down on referral material. We have no problem in inside material. Why? Because the pre-analytical factors, this protocol is designed to bring down the intensity of her two. And I have I'm more worried about getting the amplified her twos right. So that's the reason we have kept this on hold. We have started it in one machine. And so when there's a special request, we definitely do it. So you must understand this, that don't accept any HER2 low one plus from any pathology laboratory if they have not written what protocol it is. So impact of test, and this is a paper which the Roche team itself has published, that they use 19 conditions and they found out that nine actually resulted in reduction of HER2 low reporting. And the most important thing is the retrieval material, which is called as cell conditioning uh, CC1 material, that you have to have 24 minutes retrieval. If it was 20 or 52, the HER2 low came down. Then non-formalin fixatives are not to be used. If your tissues are great, less than four, I'm so sorry, or more than seven, the HER2 low came down. Now, cell block is another important thing that you can do HER2 low testing on cell block. But cytology and bone marrow samples can be used if that's the last material on the earth that is available for the patient to benefit. Otherwise, they are not the right choice. So these are two institutes under the same hospital network and they both of them use the same, they use the lock protocol 
And in the other group, they did not use the lot protocol. And obviously, when you didn't use the lot protocol, there was great variation in the HER2 low reporting. Now, when we, are, when we talk many, I run the EQUAS program in the country, and many of them only use a strong 3 plus as a control. Now, with HER2 low, not only do we have to use a 3 plus and 2 plus, we have to use a negative control because we are looking for very, very faint membrane staining. So you have to use an absolutely zero HER2 no control. You need to know, you also need to incorporate a one plus control, which not many of us are doing. And hence, we cannot use this protocol regularly. So this is the example of images from HER2 low that you have very faint, incomplete membrane staining in greater than 10% of the cells and complete membrane staining weak, but which is fish non-amplified in uh, greater than 10% of the cells. Now, the interlab reproducibility, if you use the lock protocol, is fantastic. But if you use variable protocols, it's very high. So what are the inter-observer variations? So this was an Australian study which looked at across Australia, what was the concordance. And they found a good concordance of around 93%. But in a small number of cases, uh, locally reported at HER2 zero, they were reclassified as HER2 low and vice versa also occurred. Now, there was another study which was um, uh, spearheaded by the German group, and they found that the negative in, uh, percentage reporting improved if you had training by uh, for the HER2 new interpretation. So this is one of the things we are poking, focusing on our EQUAS. The next run, we are going to look at low HER2 reporting across India, and hopefully we'll be better off in reporting. Now, does HER2 low status change? Now, I this is something very personal. I feel that HER2 low is actually an impact of the very good pre-analytical factors in able to demonstrate that low intensity of HER2 that is there in a cell. So if your pre-analytics are not good, you're not going to get HER2 low. So the smaller tissues, the more well fixed they are, the more HER2 low you will get. Whereas the bigger specimens poorly fixed, the less HER2 you will get. So what happens to post-chemotherapy? You get post-chemotherapy, there's a chance of losing the HER2 low why? Because the core biopsy is well fixed, so you get 1 plus, but in the specimen, we'll end up getting HER2 zero. Same thing happens in primary versus metastasis. If you have a core from a metastasis, the chances of having a HER2 low there is more than in a primary big specimen, which is not well fixed. So that's the issue. Then in the Destiny 4 trial, 78 per con concordance was seen between central lab versus historic lab testing, and around 19% of them which were called as 1 plus turned out to be 0 in the central lab. And in 2.7%, actually a 1 plus became 2 plus or 3 plus or amplified even. So as I said, in the resection specimen, there is a fall. Core biopsies have a higher incidence of HER2 low. Prolonged ischemia time even reduces a 2 plus to 0. So can you imagine what it does to 1 plus? And I like the Hercept test because it picks up more amplifications of HER2. Well, as a, opposed to Ventana 4B5, but as far as HER2 score 1 plus, and it also shows you more score 1 plus, but unfortunately, that's not the test that has been done on the Destiny trial, and that's why it's not popular. So do we need to revise the definition of ASCOPAC 2000 ESC? The answer is clearly yes. As I said, that zero is no staining, and ultra low should be incorporated where we, and now you know that in the Destiny 6, they have included ultra low, where you have incomplete membrane staining, weak, incomplete membrane staining in less than 10% as ultra low, and weak, incomplete membrane staining in greater than 10% as score 1 plus, and score 2 plus and 3 plus remain the same. Now, the whole thought process is moving. Remember that HER2 low is something that we do under higher magnifications. Now, we all know that when there is no staining at higher magnification, so people feel that we should incorporate our objective lens magnification as which, which you are seeing also into the reporting of her to know. So if you're seeing no staining at 40x, it's a score zero. If you're seeing complete strong membrane staining in greater than 10% under, and in fact, sometimes when I pick up a slide, I know it's three plus because it's all brown. So that's that score three plus. When you see strong staining, but in less complete staining, but in less than 10%, or you're seeing Complete membrane staining, but it is meek to moderate and in greater than 10% of cells. Both these are equivocal. Now, both these are seen at 4x, but only you have to move on to the higher part to confirm the staining pattern. So that's the equivocal score 2 plus. 
Now let's look at the incomplete pattern. Now in the incomplete, you also have a score two plus because you have strong to moderate incomplete staining in greater than 10%, that is also considered at 2 plus. And in this also, the staining is not seen at 4S, but it will have to move on to 10X and then confirm to 20X staining. Now, what are the HER2 1 plus categories? When you have weak incomplete membrane staining in greater than 10% or weak uh, incomplete staining in less than 10%, both these stainings are only visible at 20S. So pathologists who are in a hurry often mix and it has come up at uh, 40X. So, my gut feeling is all these three categories that I've shown you, that is where your HER2 low lies and that's the need to pick it up. So what is the de issues with IHC definition? You already heard some papers that even with ultra low tumors, you have now response with TDX1. So you need to have a boundary which is better. As I said, the antibodies that are developed in HER2 new are against the amplified antigen. They are not against normal HER2. And that's why they target more of 2 plus and 3 plus. So probably we need to have a better antibodies that will hurt, that will pick up just the normal or two. I see interpretation is semi-quantitative observer dependent and it is susceptible to human error. So are there any other tests that can be used to identify HER2 low? Of course, we can use mRNA levels. But mRNA levels don't give you the cutoffs of 10% that we are looking for in the Destiny 4 trials. Plus, mRNA levels, when you do an mRNA, it gets diluted with the adjacent mRNA, so they don't meet the same cutoffs. We are, UV, we are attempting droplet digital PCR in Tata Hospital. Pratna, one of my colleagues, and Sangeeta, they are working on it, and we'll get some data very soon. You can use a mass spec-based interpretation also, but these are not what the destiny trial was formulated on. AI is, I think, a wonderful tool, but we are testing the Roche AI algorithm for score 1+. And again, Sangeeta, my co colleague, is working on it and we'll see. Unfortunately, I think we've got uh, a little variation basically because of a staining pattern. So to conclude, HER2 testing in breast cancer has expanded from detecting HER2 amplification to detecting HER2 low with consequent increase in its use as a potential target. The definition of HER2 low is very simple. However, it's mar marred by variation in testing methodology interpretation and awareness. And I think awareness is the key for the successful use of this biomarker. Newer markers are needed and they are being investigated, but only time will tell how effective they are. So to, uh, to conclude, you know, this is what any biomarker testing follows. It becomes fun. So I don't know where we are. I think it, we are in this run where this is hard and I got this or not. So we are in that particular part of this curve. And thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Now we move on to the panel discussion. Our moderator is Dr. Tejinder Singh, medical oncologist, Mumbai. Over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tanuja. I think it was a wonderful talk and I think all these HER2 things is something, you know, it is going on changing, but post TDX, I think uh, things have changed a lot. So I will be speaking on the, I think it's visible, no? The slides are visible. Yes, it is yes, visible. They're they not full screen, but they're visible. Yeah, just one minute. Now I think it will become whole screen. Thank you. So, so I'll just call my uh, panelist, Dr. Anuradha. I can see she's there now. She was the first speaker. And Dr. Yes. Kaushik, Dr. Lakshma Reddy, and Dr. Mubarak Matose. So yes. we'll quickly start, I think, running short of time of nearly 10-15 minutes. But we'll have a good discussion based on the topics which we discussed in the previous uh, talks. So this is a case uh, of a 50-year-old post-menopausal lady and uh, with a right breast lump. This is not a case of mine. This is a case which was given to me. So hormone positive like ER 70%, PR 70%, HER2 0. T2 tumor 5 cm given TC 4 seconds and patient had undergone surgery followed by radiation adjuvant letrozole. And germline 
Dhaka HBOC panel testing was negative. Now, in 2000, from 2017 to 2022, that means around five years later on, patient complained of severe back pain. MRI was suggestive of bony mats. Now, these are the PET scan. You can see here a pleural base soft tissue mass also uh, and on both the sides, basically bilateral lung, the largest was on the right upper lobe. There were also mediastinal nodes and you can see hepatomegaly with a multiple liver lesions, multiple liver lesions. Also on the bones, right clavicle, there was a lytic lesion, vertebral lesions, uh, sacral and both the pelvic bones showed uh, lesions. There was a partial collapse of the L1 vertebra. So the rebiopsy showed that it is a breast cancer, only GATA3 positive, KI67 is 6070 positive, HER2 is 1 plus, FISH is negative, IHC 1 plus, ERPR is still positive. Now, so let us start with Dr. Mubarika. Do you really do biopsy again in this kind of patient? Patient already is on letrozole and then she, she has progressed. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, when a patient uh, progresses um, on therapy, uh, we need to do rebiopsy and look for uh, receptor status again. Okay. I do it yeah. in the so I think biopsy is something which all of us do. We do the biopsy. Uh, so, but do you do recheck the HER2 status on the early, earlier blocks? No, no, I I don't check. Uh, I what uh, the present status the uh, on the fresh tissue. I prefer to do a uh, ERPR her to repeat. Right, Doctor Anuradha. Any change? I think biopsy we do for everyone, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, I think there's a lot of issues connection issue with Anuradha. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Kaushik, any different thoughts about, you know, when we talk about so much talk about the dynamic expression of HER2 low. So, do you uh, do the rebiopsy? Do you check the HER2 on the previous blocks? Sir, uh, no, sir, definitely. We don't usually check on the archival specimen, but uh, biopsy is uh, the once the disease has progressed and we have a good uh, biopsy site from the metastatic site, at least. We do rebiopsy and do the basic changes test on that. And archival test, we don't actually practice getting the virtual done. Yeah, I think I think this question basically another question comes is naturally this is a metastatic disease, you know, but HER2 is something which is quite, you know, there's a dynamic uh, uh, expression. Uh, there's a paper also, I think I'll just put up here is uh, looking at the evolution which happens between uh, early and advanced disease. And you can here see, you know, the IHC score increased from the primary to metastatic tumor in nearly 44% of the patient. Low to zero evolution was nearly seen in, so low to, basically when you see low to zero expression was seen in nearly 22% of the patient. So her to low expression is dynamic and maybe changed a lot in the advanced stage setting. So Dr. Tanuja, what is your thought on this paper? You know, I think we do quote this paper a lot nowadays. So, as I said, if you remember in my talk, so according to me, uh, Dr. Tejinder, is that uh, I don't think it's the stage of disease. I think what happens is that low HER2 is probably more than zero in Agreed. our patients. And what happens is because you're not monitoring your pre-analytics too much, you miss out on many of the one plus scores and you end up calling them as zero. And with better pre-analytics, you tend to get better things. My, my own personal experience has been that we get more HER2 low in metastatic setting. And it's not because I think it's not because the tumor has changed. It's just because our metastatic biopsies are little, you know, they're core biopsies, they're well fixed, whereas in specimens. So that's my take on this. And between early and advanced cancer is, I'm not, I have read this paper, but I don't remember the Detail, uh, details of it again as I said I just quoted that uh, from primary to metastatic there is an evolution of 44 percent and it has the one plus is more in metastatic and I think this is the reason rather than the tumor itself increasing its HER2 on the copy number because if you look at the copy number pattern 
there isn't much change. There's not much change. I okay. think what you said this is, is very ILC right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think what you said is very right. You know, it's the copy number has not changed so much. Now, coming to the question about discordance, uh, Dr. Kaushik, uh, I think Destiny was quite, you know, they had mentioned a lot about the discordance about the HER2 testing. Do you st you you feel the discordance is there in the HER2 testing? Yeah, definitely. We, uh, we, we, we do experience around 10 to 20 percent discordance in the testing based on the center's reporting, based on the lab reporting. 10 to 15 percent, we usually see the discordance. Mainly, uh, if it is pitch negative, then it is more of a subject to testing side. A lot of pre analytical errors which are explained with the map. Some centers giving one plus, some centers giving the two plus lab wise. So we do experience the discordance. Okay. Dr. Lakshman, can I say something? Pardon? Yes, Pardon. So the thing is that, see, this her to low has been defined using Ventana machine. Yeah. Now, while most of us are using Ventana machine, but these are only privileged centers which have high workload that can use an automated IHC like Ventana. And uh, so the problem is that if you're not using the Ventana 4B5, you cannot call something as her to low. That's number one that all clinicians need to understand. And if you're using manual testing methods, then there is a whole lot of... I think what I would like to advocate is promote your pathologist to at least use the Ventana 4B5 on the automated platform. And if they can't do it, at least outsource it to a thing. And because many people are still using manual IFC to report their R2. And with her advent of her to low, I think that is something from message that we have to convey across. Agreed. I think this is something which we need to convey to our hospitals also. Because in a bigger center, madam, it is not a big issue. But what you said is very right. helpful. But, uh, you know, in a, if suppose the hospital is not so much in doing it, I think there are a good number of labs which are doing it in a central way also. So I think it, that's very important. Uh, Dr. Lakshma, uh, Dr. Lakshma Reddy also, what are the chances of discordant testing which you see in your practice? Yeah, good evening. So there is nearly 10 to 15 percent of the patients we see that there is discordance. And generally, on seeing that, we generally get it reviewed by our pathologist when there is some discordance from one lab to the other. And we see the biology of the disease also here plays a role. Means like we see the biology of the disease. How is it metastasizing? What are the sites of metastasis? And we discuss with the pathologist of uh, what are the chances of discordance. And then we take a call whether to get it retested or not. So we go up. Yeah. So I think Destiny 4 basically looked into the discordance or concordance between the historical and the and the central HER2 results. And there was nearly 78% of the samples which were designated as HER2 low by the prior uh, local results were confirmed as HER2 low by the central testing. That means there were nearly 22% patient uh, who had discordant samples. So quite good. But like I, I strongly feel, uh, you know, uh, things might change with the Ventana, which is coming up in a big way. Most of the bigger hospitals are taking up. But wherever the facility is not there, man manual is there, I think we should look into uh, look into sending the sample. Madam, how much this AI will change the whole picture now? So AI... You know, you know I, I just, I was reading just few days back about the PDL one testing also. PDL one also the AI was able to upgrade it by nearly 20 30 percent. Those who are negative, they had become positive of person. So for PDL one hundred percent, I think AI is very good. Yeah. But how to low? The problem is that the AI. So the we are testing the Roche algorithm for. There is a they have a AI based algorithm for her to new. And what my experience has been that if your sample quality is not good, the AI goes goes wrong. So right. if I'm running a bad sample into an AI machine, it interprets wrong. But AI picks up, one thing about AI is that, you know, we, uh, it scans, but uh, the, the Roche algorithm, you have to pick the areas of interest. So what happens is none of the AIs are automatic. You go and you mark an area. So it's Sorry. still observer dependent. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not the AI that, you know, like suppose you scan a Xerox that way it doesn't do. You have to pick up the areas of interest and then it will tell you whether it's 1 plus, 2 plus or 3 plus there. That's been my experience that it is observer dependent to an extent. It is fantastic, but it's observer dependent to an extent. And number two, it's greatly influenced by folds or thickness of the section or quality of staining and all those things. Yeah, I think, but 
somehow ai is picking up pace like what we expected that it will not in india the situation is a little difficult because <laughs> of course you must understand that insurance pay for the test Agreed. so all of them have ventana all of Agreed. them have x machine so they all have deco they have they that's the lab does not exist if these facilities are not there but in india that's not the scene right so i think what uh, dr tanuja said was very right you know she the the reason looking at when you try to optimize the performance i think these are the um, things which are very important I, looking at the type of assay ischemia time biopsy type so uh, sample handling also so uh, dr kaushik uh, i think when we talk about the isc uh, are there any gaps in the current definition of isc because i think uh, things are like you know we still not uh looking at you know are you looking at ultra low and or telling your pathologist to give report like that presently we are not practicing the ultra low but uh, i think the ma'am has uh, very beautifully alluded to this uh, definitions and what are the great functions are uh, presently and how it is to be reported in our center we are not uh, still using this ultra low definition yeah i think what uh, dr tanuja said was very right i think uh many of the centers have still not started doing it but yes yes you know uh, the her2 testing has become like you know uh, buzz talk about all this ultra low and uh, low things over there now coming to the question about you know dr tonse mumarika uh, if suppose you have initial biopsy so do you plan treatment based on the initial biopsy or re biopsy actually in this case i think the biopsy re biopsy will be more helpful right Yes, uh, always uh, we look at the fresh biopsy results when treating. Generally, uh, there is receptor transformation from hormone positive to triple negative. In such a scenario, uh, we if we pick up the initial results and treat them with the endocrine therapy, it will it wouldn't work. So I think it's the rebiopsy specimen uh, uh, receptor status is more important for treatment. Yeah, so like in this case, if suppose the first biopsy would have shown one plus, and the metastatic biopsy after five years is showing zero, will you still think about looking at giving the uh, option of TDX to those patients? Mm, a very good question. I think I would uh, ask the as Ma'am said, what platform they have done? Uh, who's report? It's all Ventana. Only Doctor Tanuja has told it is ultra low. She herself is telling us. Said it is ultra low. The current. So she, so she cross checked the first specimen also five years back, and now she is telling right now it is uh, her to zero only. But the five years previous specimen was showing ultra low. Ah, uh, her to zero. I would be very skeptical to use in her to sir. So anyway, I think it's a question which nobody knows. Unknown. What should be used for treatment decision making? Whether how much importance we should give it. Uh, so I think uh, uh, one important thing is, you know, patients who are uh, normally uh, use of targeted therapy like anti her therapy, endocrine therapy, uh, we can think about using it, but I think it's with a pinch of salt, like the case which I described, where deliberately you're trying to see. But I follow what uh, Dr. Mubarika said, that if the present specimen is not showing a, positive status, I will not go ahead with the TDX over there. Dr. Tejinder, I think even destiny criteria is the same. Yeah, yeah, madam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I had just put up a question which is more of a, you know, sometimes we try to deliberately uh, see that some her to positivity comes and we should be able to give it. But you said very nicely in a triple negative, if her to is positive, uh, it's ultra low. The behavior is still like triple negative only. Right, Dr. Tanuja, I think? Yes, yes. Because so I think it's a marker, it's not really a disease. If marker is not. I think we'll... So these were the destiny key eligibility criteria. I think uh, uh, never previously... I think she already mentioned uh, uh, never previously her two positive on prior pathology testing or it was uh, her two zero only. So I think question is very clear. I think we have to not only look at the her true ultra law, we have to think about... Uh, what is right for our patients also. So this patient uh, re-biopsy showed her to one plus fish negative uh, ER 
positive 90 percent pr was 85 percent high k 67 so started on abimam cycle event for this trend a very good choice i would say so uh, after eight months the patient started showing progressive disease and later on what we do is normally this is a scenario sometimes we see commonly you know five years the patient has done very well on uh, anti-hormone therapy and when later on they don't respond so nicely to it so this patient was started on capsetabine and started progressing on new bone lesions so dr anuradha uh, dr anuradha would have you would you have done something different than this I think there is some issue with Dr. Anuradha. Dr. Kaushik, any different things what you would have done? Uh, uh, no, so they have uh, definitely used the CDK process inhibitor uh, mm -hmm. second line. And third line, maybe if the PS was put uh, oral versus uh, cytotoxic chemo, they have not been exposed to any anthracycline or something. Okay. That was the chance. Okay, so Dr. Mubarika, anything different? Uh, yes, sir. I would have sent for PCM mutation testing. Uh, yeah. She was hormone receptor positive. So I would, rather than giving chemotherapy, I would have looked for options of subsequent hormone therapy. Agreed. I think uh, what you said is pick three. Normally we do it uh, commonly. But you know, the biggest issue day by day is happening is that in spite of PIK3 coming positive, the survival is not so good with alpha sleep and other things. Mm -hmm. So what you said is right. We should send it for PIK3. Dr. Lakshma Reddy, what should be the next line of treatment? So, so as previously mentioned, as previously mentioned, once the patient progresses on hormonal therapy, our standard line means like we try to do uh, look for pic 3 ca mutation, whether alplasip can be tried or not. If not, the otherwise, we as of now, we are still going towards uh, giving some form of chemotherapy, whether it is a paclitaxel or any other chemotherapy agents. But with the current evidence that we have uh, using um, uh, TDXG is also, it's that is still coming up, but we have not still not tried it, but that evidence is still coming up. As of now, if the patient is refractory to hormonal agents, we are still using chemotherapy, the standard chemotherapy we are using. Yeah, I think uh, uh, now the question, basically, I strongly feel uh, one plus fish negative. I think these are the patients which were taken up for Destiny 04 study, I think, which uh, previous speakers have, have nicely elaborated about it. And this is one area where Destiny has scored very nicely. If you see, they had taken up patients who had previously one to two prior lines of chemotherapy they had taken up over there. And uh, this is the demographic and baseline characteristics. So good number of patients, uh, nearly, you know, uh, I will say more patients were in the hormone positive status and uh, nearly 60% were in the one plus. And two plus IAC negative were around 41. So this is a very subset of population which is which had been taken up for the destiny and these are the uh, patients who had taken prior number of lines of therapy one two or three so you know destiny took up a patient which was bad prognosis patient and still you see the very good you know pfs in a hormone positive uh, in cases you know you can see a, a, a 10.1 month basically median pfs as compared to the 5.4 and the traditional uh, with the chemotherapy. So this is the OS data also, you know, a, a difference, a updated analysis has shown 20, nearly 24 months survival as compared to 17 with the chemotherapy. So basically in a hormone positive cohort and all patient cohort, median OS was consistent with results of the primary analysis showing a nearly 31% reduction in the risk of death. I think because of the cost, we are not using it so I strongly feel this drug will make a lot of difference if you uh, leave the toxicity part. So new thing which is coming, Mubarakaniza, is uh, sacituzumab, right? Yeah. So given a choice, what you, will you prefer? I think the data is better for um, her to, this and her too. Yes. And uh, toxicity, uh, I guess, is... Topics also, topics also basically had good number of patients which are hormone positives. Yeah, and uh, ILD uh, 
except for the ILD thing, I think uh, it's I would I would subject my patient to and her to dance as it is. Uh, I think right now, honestly speaking, I strongly feel. Uh, the sacitosomab is picking up. Only thing is that it is mainly approved for the third line and beyond. So, but even in a third line, you can see a difference, you know, 5.5 as compared to 4 uh, with a hazard ratio of nearly 0. Uh, 0.65. So, but sacitosomab is basically for the third line and Destiny basically looked at the second line. So, uh, I have it, one in, uh, question. So, if a patient who has low ejection fraction, like and not eligible, 45% ejection fraction. So obviously in her too, is there any, um, I mean, experience that in her too? My experience is only with previously trial basis patient, not too much of patients with it. But uh, the policy will not change like what we do for our transtrosomal patients. So if the patient, if the patient is having uh, uh, a low ejection fraction, I think uh, uh, we can discuss with the family and give one dose and see it. But we need to monitor the ejection fraction frequently with every prior seconds. Only when the options are very limited. Otherwise, I will not use it. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. So, but uh, sacitosomab, like I said, is something which uh, uh, is something which we normally, it's not available also, but it, it, it is coming up in a big way. So, Dr. Lakshmarati, what is the... Uh, this question about rechallenging with another TKI. Do you rechallenge or you change the TKI at CTK46? Or Kaushik, you can take the question rechallenging with another CTK46. So presently, we are not using this rechallenge option at present practice, but we have seen the data coming up with the maintain or post manner data. But more of all, the data, the, whatever the positive results were. After uh, the initial palvocyclic, they did better. Uh, who had initially had only palvocyclic exposure or the uh, the duration of exposure more than 12 months, they had somewhat better results with rechallenge. I think there are much more uh, facts to be considered before rechallenging, and it will not. It may not be for everyone's risk. It may not be suiting for everyone to rechallenge. A certain subset like who have been used palvocyclic earlier or, or duration more than 12. I think those were maybe the suitable candidates. Still more need to look into the data. Yeah, agreed. I think he has answered very nicely that uh, this is more of a conflicted data about re-challenge. You know, the maintained study was quite positive study that those patients who have been previously exposed to palbo were given ribo and they had shown response. But the other PACE study had not shown that much. So basically, overall, I will say there are still more studies which are going to give us an answer whether re-challenge is possible or not. So, uh, Dr. Kaushik, if the patient is germline BRCA mutant positive, what is the optimal sequencing you will do here? Uh, sequencing, definitely, there's uh, no one knows what is optimal <laughs> sequencing. But yes, we have a plethora of options in hand. And based on the doctor, based on the uh, profile of the patient, we can choose. At least we have uh, many things to pick up on the bucket. Yeah, I think uh, Talazo is also coming up. But, you know, I think triple negative breast cancer. Now the data is coming up of using uh, uh, Ola Pare with Pembro also. So I think uh, the, since the number is very less, we can give it many of the drugs together also. So current knowledge, I think a lot of gaps are there. Uh, will ultimately, will her to uh, ISC levels matter in the end for TDX? In clinical practice, will you give maintenance endocrine therapy for her to low? if TDX is stopped due to toxicity. So I think, uh, Kaushik, you can wind up the last question. If the patient is HER2 low and uh, but TDX, you cannot give it because of ILD. Will you continue the endocrine therapy? Sir, but coming, taking the first question, sir, definitely Destiny 6 will change the complete practice, I guess, and with the availability of uh, NR2. But they are just incorporating everyone in towards the NR2. So that will change it up. And Definitely, there are too low. If our, our, our TDX has been stopped, uh, endocrine therapy, we need to keep in some form of therapy to all these uh, HR positive patients. I would keep them in some form of endocrine therapy. Yeah, great. I think thank you. Thank you, Kaushik. Thank you, Dr. Anuradha and uh, Dr. Mubarika and Dr. Lakshmaradi. And thank you, Dr. Danuja, for uh, giving, us, giving us so much.
thoughts about all this testing thing which is going on. So we are looking up for the pathologist to give us more HER2 low so that we can use the drugs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.